Hey, hey, and, and thanks, um, Rhino. And isn't it a great venue that we've got here? And uh, a special thanks to my team for um, this brand new venue. A round of applause for them straight up. Thanks. So. We wanted to do something very special for our 90th year, and so thanks, Rainer, and of course, the wonderful Arat, both of whom are wonderful ambassadors for landscape. Um, we, we really, in our, our theme for this 90th year, it's one of transformation, and so, you know, we've wanted to celebrate the work of the landscape profession over the last nine decades, and it's been a wonderful year. So we really thank the um, Norwegian uh, Landscape Architects Association for sharing in our 90th celebrations at, at Olympic Park. Um, and, and we sort of, they returned the favour for us with many of us participating from the LI in their global congress at, in IFLA at, at, in Oslo. So we do look forward to much more North Sea based collaboration in the future. I was up at the Scottish branch and uh, um, just a few weeks ago and we said perhaps 2022, 2024 in Edinburgh, we can, we can match that. So Rhino, you're on for, for one of those dates and, and we'll, we'll take up that very kind offer, so thank you. Um, and, and when we were at the um, Common Ground Conference of, of the Norwegian Landscape Architects Association, um, our members participated actively there. You've got Sarah Jones Morris, the chair of our Southwest branch, who really spoke strongly from the heart about the role of the Anthropocene, our, our terrible impacts on this great planet of ours, and also Adam's championing this great profession, um, you know, that it's got the superhero powers for the future that are needed to solve many of the world's great problems. But central to that particular Congress were some really important skills that this profession really owns those around the, the fields of co-design, community engagement, and community empowerment. And actually, when you look at the finalists we have here today, many of those who are finalists here actually do that very well, bottom up rather than top down, and they are the human skills of the future that we all need to develop to be successful, and sometimes we don't just celebrate those things enough. We've also celebrated um, some of the, the, the greats of the profession. And throughout the year, we've, we've run events, you know, celebrating people like Brenda Colvin, the first female president of any built or natural environment professional body in this country. You know, this profession led the way in terms of gender equity in the professions. Dame Sylvia Crow, um, a, a na namesake of one of the awards we have later today. Sir Geoffrey Jellicoe, many of you who know, and, and um, you know, celebrate the work of Hal Mogridge, who also participated in, in Oslo, who'll be coming later today, and Hal's a real champion of this profession. Our longest serving registered practice is, Hal, is Colvin and Mogridge, actually, and you know, we need to celebrate the past contribution of those greats. And we've had many great partners through this year, like UCL, London Lake, Legacy D Development Corporation, Hardscape, our major sponsors today, and Vestra, who sponsored many of our LI90 events earlier this year. We, we've really celebrated the, the, the contribution that this profession has had right across the country, actually, um, and our branches have got in on the act as well. Um, from Bristol, where they were looking at those issues of co-design and community engagement that I touched on. I know our southeast branch did the rewilding of the Nepa State. We had exhibitions around landscape in Manchester, and most recently we had a, a, a special film about McCarg's contribution in Edinburgh, and he was well ahead of his time. The introduction of ecological planning at the heart of our planning systems was only possible through that, that connection between Scotland and the US of A. And, uh, you know, tonight, if anyone um, gets away early and is heading back to the northeast, we've got a film night in Newcastle, if anyone wants to join us as a continuation of the LI90 events. Of, of course, um, our organisation was founded, um, Arat mentioned this earlier, in 1929 at Chelsea, at the, the, the then flower show, um, and, and its first name was the British Association of Garden Architects, you know, deep rooted in the work of, you know, the likes of Capability Brown and Sir Humphrey Repton. But then it very quickly changed its name to the Institute of Landscape Architects, and from the mid-1970s became the Landscape Institute we know today. And at that point, the really significant point was a broadening of the profession to represent those involved not only in design, but planning, management, and the sciences, the full landscape life cycle that we're continuing to build on and add to today. 
Um, and now I must um, spend a, a send a special thanks to a number of people in this room, particularly our president, Adam White, um, and his business partner, Andre Davies, for the great work that they've done in raising the profile of the profession this year through their work with the Duchess of Cambridge and the RHS's Back to Nature Garden. We hope that we'll have our first ever landscape apprentice from their guidance and work with the Duchess. So we, we hope that she'll enrol very quickly on our new program next year, Adam. Um, but but the, his um, commitment to the profession was one that in every single media release attached to that work, landscape architecture was referenced in every single media release that went around the world through this year. We thank them, and in particular the Director General of the RHS, um, Sue Biggs, who enabled us to actually host a very special um, birthday event at Chelsea where we were formed with many of our past presidents um, who celebrated that particular event. Now turning to, to one of, a very important issue for many of you here in this room is that of the skills shortage we face in our sector today. We've actually provided much work with that as part of our Choose Landscape campaign to really modernise our approach to reach the next generation with badges, t-shirts, postcards, get in touch if you need some. But, but in the short term, we've also had to get landscape architecture listed um, with the Migration Advisory Committee as a skill shortage um, occupation because many of you struggle with recruiting enough people to actually do the work ahead of you. And this is going to be one of the big issues we have going forward for us. We've been working also for the longer term, building on, on those campaigns to actually accredit more courses. We've got UCL's Bartlett School now having a landscape architecture course. Newcastle are bringing their master's course in landscape architecture back next year, I'm pleased to report today. And we've also engaged 13 educators to develop two new landscape apprenticeships. So they're going to be coming into force They're at various stages of approval, and they'll be rolled out next year and the year after. Um, right Right around the country, so, so around, around England, and then we're looking beyond to other nations as well. And, and we've also been looking to improve skills for existing professionals, a great CPD program. We've got a new online um, portal called LI Campus coming next year, and there's, there's much more for us to do in, uh, going forward. So. We, we want the profession to be more open and inclusive, and as I touched on, we've got many disciplines in landscape practice today, um, and, and we've moved well beyond the field of landscape architecture now to looking at those other disciplines, as well as digital practice, garden design and parks management, as we want to be the home for all of those people here in the Landscape Institute. Um, th these skills are needed more than ever before. Place management is also another field that we'd be working quite closely on. And, and to do this, we've also been broadening the profession, introducing a new te technical grade of membership that'll come into force, recognizing those many critical landscape technicians who work in all of your practices today. And we, we, diversity inclusion is something that's really close to my heart. Um, we've actually committed to making this profession much more diverse and inclusive. Um, we, we've actually, I'm one of the few um, out LGBT leaders of any professional body in the country, and we want every single landscape practitioner to be comfortable in themselves, in their workplaces, and also out on site. Many of our women really struggle with the way they're treated by construction workers on sites. We've been actively working to get women into leadership roles in this profession through our recent elections, and we've also been making sure we attract more diverse candidates from different backgrounds. One of our most, um, we always um, will only have diverse panels at the events we run now, and we've also made sure that we are openly recruiting at every opportunity new voices into this great profession, whether it be our awards with our great judges, I know there's 50 of you here today, our new climate panel, all of that is looking to reach you know, the, the many, many voices that make up that landscape family that, that, um, that, that Reiner spoke of. We're, we're also really looking to, to build beyond that and give platforms and show role models for diverse voices. You'll see here our, our most recent um, event with University of East London where we brought Walter Hood across from the USA. We have very few black landscape architects in this country. We are well out of kilter with society. We need to, as we grow and as we introduce those new apprenticeships, reach the diverse communities that make up the UK and beyond. 
and we need to give them a voice within this profession. We, we don't have many disabled um, members in this profession either. They're probably two of our weakest areas that we need to improve upon for the next decade and beyond. Um, we, we had, in addition, Ingrid Pollard, Ron Ware, and many others join us for a special event in, in London. Um, we've also been showing role models across the LGBT community with a Rainbow Places Network to support um, the future of the profession in a diverse way. Um, turning to the climate crisis and the biological diversity. Ah, thank, thank you. Turning to the big issue of our day, that of the climate and biological diversity emergency. Um, we declared in June, and we know that we're not where we need to be as an organisation or as a profession, but that we have many of the skills in this room that will help society and your clients and governments around the world get to where they need to get to to meet those net zero targets. We all need to remember that that's now legislation in this country to get to net zero by 2050, and if we can do it earlier, then all the more for it. Um, we need to actually do much more to equip our members to deliver on this, on this topic. And, we're, and as um, Adam will touch on later, I want us to be judged by the actions that we take, not just our words on this important topic. Um, we all have to do much more in our personal lives, in our businesses, and in the practices that we, that we work within. Um, it's encouraging to see some of the new legislation that's coming through. We, we hope that um, going forward we can see much stronger government commitments, particularly with a new environment bill in the, in the UK. Um, I, I think the, the Scotland and Welsh governments need a call out for co congratulations for the work they're doing, um, particularly in Wales with now health impact assessments and also compulsory resilience on most um, government projects. And in Scotland, urban, urban farming requirements. And also they're, they're um, looking at extending building regulations to landscape for the first time in Scotland, something that I think needs to be championed in many more places around the world. So they're really at the forefront of you know, pushing forward with natural capital and, and climate going forward. Moving, moving on. In, in England, we, we are looking at a new Environment Act and the work of Natural England, and we're very pleased to have um, Marion Spain here talking later. The work on green infrastructure will be critical. We need to influence the National Infrastructure Commission to move infrastructure spend from grey to green and blue, and we, we'll be looking to continue to promote the world-leading cities of the world, whether it be places like Ebbsfleet, who have landscape at their heart, and congratulations to our members involved in that, that great um, project that, that we ran as a competition last year. Whether it be Suzhou, Singapore, or most, Barcelona that we covered at our conference, or the likes of Medellin, which Medellin has landscape number one in its Medellin 4.0 strategy. It's connecting green corridors across the city, ripping up streets, and putting social equality at the heart of what it does in a way that we all need to take inspiration from, share that best practice, and bring that forward to, to here in the UK. Um, another important um, opportunity for this profession as we move through to 2020 is the High Streets Task Force. Um, the, the LI is a partner with many other organisations. Obviously, with a, an election coming up, I can't say too much other than to say we've been contracted as part of that consortia to actually um, develop expertise and provide up to 20 experts from across the profession to advise high streets across England on the future transformations that are needed. And expect us to engage more, particularly in the West Midlands into 2020, where we'll be hosting our next Landscape and Place Convention with our friends from the Design Council the Institute of Place Management, Birmingham City Uni, West Midlands Combined Authority, the Bid Foundation and more. We're looking to focus on those themes of climate, how we do infrastructure better and the future of high streets next year. Now turning, um, as, I, as I sort of wrap up really, it, there is an election period and, and you wouldn't expect me not to say something about the election. Um, and and I've, I've shared with you some of our asks for what, what the Landscape Institute will be taking up with any new government that's elected. And really it comes down to three main things. Um, we'll really be looking, um, number one, we'll be very much around looking at skills and uh, looking to build the capacity of this profession. Number two, we'll be using the skills of this profession to tackle social and health inequalities. 
And number three will be um, to address that climate and biodiversity emergency, we'll be expecting much better regulation, much better planning, but most importantly, the investment and the funding to manage our green spaces, parks and places going forward, something that hasn't been there over much of the past decade. And finally, um, as, I, as I sort of wrap up, as I move on to some thank yous, um, it's really important that we thank our many, many active volunteers. Here's our board and council at their most recent um, meeting up in Leicester. Um, we've, we're so lucky at the LI to have over 800 active volunteers. And when you think we've got 3,500 chartered members, that's a phenomenal um, volume of volunteers that we have. I think a, a, a special round of applause for the volunteers who make this great institute what it is today. I've just shared with you a little snapshot, really, of the change that they've been supporting. Just as that theme of transformation was celebrated for LI90, our own institute um, has to also transform. The worst possible thing for any organisation at a great time of change is to stand still, and we definitely have not been standing still. We're looking to transform our institute into a much more sustainable, modern, digital and agile and relevant organisation. We're really looking forward today to hearing about some of the um, ideas from Marion Spain in Natural England, who I know shares the passion of many in this room for the multifunctional benefits and value that can be created through landscape. Of course, as well, the legendary Sir David Attenborough, growing up in Australia, we grew up on your uh, documentaries. It was, you know, core viewing in my geography classes in year seven and year eight, back in Lizaro High in Australia. And uh, I would look forward to hearing what you have to say today. Um, thanks to all of our sponsors. Um, and for the first time ever, we have sponsored every single category at our LI Awards. Um, we've also... Um, I, got, um, I should just mention, I just caught out the corner of my eye, please note that whatever you say, we have an artist working, Josh Knowles, looking at all of our, um, what we say. So do be careful if you come up to the stage and have to talk, because it's going to be captured and there's, uh, he's, he's got quite a bit there that he's started on already. So um, thank you, Josh, and we look forward to the outputs from, from your work today. Um, to each of our finalists here today, the best of luck. They are an excellent bunch. and. Me being three years in, many of the projects I've been to see when I go to see employers are here today, and it's really exciting to see them up and getting the, the, the sort of rewards that they deserve. Um, thanks also to our many, uh, many of our judges. Um, there's about 50 of them, and we're quite unique here at the LI. Um, our judging is changed every year. We do an open call for judges. We have people inside and outside the profession judging, and it's totally objective, and it changes every year. So it's not just a closed shop. It's not just the same people deciding all the time. It's actually a really open and transparent process we go through, and a really rigorous one. So um, in, I'm just going to close at that point and thank them, and then um, on thanking them, uh, let's do a round of applause for the judges, and then we'll be... Uh, thank you, yeah. That's all from me. Enjoy the rest of the show and enjoy the highlights of our judging weekend and enjoy the day. Congratulations to all. Thank you.